Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. I am very happy to be here. And uh, uh, before I start talking about our main topic, which is generated text, as you can already see, a few words about my person. I'm chair of Romance Linguistics here at the TU Dresden. I um, work mainly on two Romance languages, French and Italian. You will see, I will give um, some examples and you will see the data is in uh, these two Romance languages just for, to, for me to know who has some kind of knowledge of French or Italian. Yeah. Okay, some minimal, that's good. <laughs> and um, I would like to, uh, to, to use these languages also to show that it's very important to work, especially when we talk about uh, generated texts with large language models, that we also look at data from other languages than English, because there is a massive research done on English. But if we consider um, other languages, we can see stuff that we could not see if we only focus on English. So that's very important. And one of my points will be to show you the importance of including other languages such as French and Italian. So I'm going to talk about uh, generating text with large language models. You perhaps know what I'm talking about, but I'm going to explain what it is. And I have two, the focus is on two aspects, the training data on the one hand, and uh, correlated to that, of course, is the textual output. These two things go together. Uh, what we have in the training data will have an influence on the output. Um, and this is why also I have uh, brought this uh, image that I've generated myself. Um, you have, can also, as you know, generate images here with e deep AI. Uh, generated, I generated this with the prompt butterfly effect because uh, this is also, we can also talk about butterfly effect in uh, these large language models when we look at the data and the output. Okay, and it's also important to look at the other way around, to look at the output to, to gain some knowledge of what we have in the training data because the training data is not accessible. So it's just by, uh, it's practically by reverse engineering that we can gain the knowledge of uh, the data itself. Okay, so let's start with, um, I already asked you a question, but another question is, who knows with your hand if you know what I'm talking about when I say Gabrielle and Toby? No. Uh, <laughs> ChatGPT and Bard? Yeah, almost everyone, or everyone. So this is absolutely expected. And um, these names I brought to you to show you two different kinds of, uh, of software that we have at our disposal to generate text uh, automatically. The first two are names, and they're not my friends nor my colleagues, those are the names of software that, um, were, that are still used, actually, it's a tool that are still used to generate text on the basis of a template. I have brought an example to show you how this works. So, you have a, a text, this is fairly short, um, about the, the, the results at the stock market. And you can see that in this text, there are lots of numbers. And in this text, so you have gaps filled by these numbers that are taken from an Excel spreadsheet table that you can see on the right hand side. So this is a, it's a way of automating texts that are very repetitive because the only thing that changes in the text are practically the numbers that changes uh, daily if you think about the stock market. So this is one, uh, as that this one uh, tool that is still used uh, in the media, for instance, to generate texts that are very repetitive and um, based on this templates-based um, technique. Now, um, so this, these software were named, are named Toby. That's a software that is used in the Swiss media, for instance, after elections, uh, or Gabriele. Now, what uh, we want to talk about here is not this, uh, this template-based uh, um, techniques, but is uh, main, the main, the, the, the one that we all uh, talk about and the more important and, and sophisticated uh, tool, namely large language models such as ChatGPT. Uh, so, as you know, perhaps ChatGPT was launched almost a year ago, day by day, on November 30th, uh, 2022. And um, as soon as it was launched, uh, it became viral. Everybody was talking about it. It has been quite down a little bit now. But we could read a lot of assessments on uh, the, the, the output generated by 
ChatGPT in the media, uh, in particular on the quality of these texts. Now you perhaps yourself have read that they, they, they are able to produce texts that are very, uh, very good, very good quality, uh, close to human <laughs> written texts, um, but that they also have flaws, they have bias, there are biases in these texts, and they, have, they also have um, um, problems. Um, so what I want to do um, now here is to show you a little bit more of what this means and how we can evaluate this more systematically from the point of view of linguistics, which is my field. So I'm not going to tell you anything about the computational side, but more about the, the linguistic side, the features, the linguistic features that we find in uh, automated text. Um, yes, uh, I also showed you this, um, this landing site, if you want, of, the, of OpenAI, because I wanted to also make you aware of uh, the, 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 the presentation of ChatGPT. This is something that we are going to look at in detail, namely, if we read this short description, we, we read, okay, we've trained a model called ChatGPT, which interacts in, an, in a conversational way. The dialogue format makes it possible for ChatGPT to answer follow-up questions, admit its mistakes, challenge uh, incorrect premises, and and this is what I'm particularly interested in, reject inappropriate requests. So the question is, things has, have changed even in this short amount of time. But you can see what we were able to generate in 2011 as opposed to 2020. Using the same, what is called prompt, the part in bold, the, that's a, that would be the prompt, a very short prompt, it's a part of a sentence, the meaning of life. And the task was simply to complete the sentence and to generate a text. So what we have as a result in 2011, you can see here the meaning of life is the tradition of the ancient human reproduction, colon, it is less favorable to the good boy for when to remove her bigger, and then the text ends here, and of course I see reactions, <laughs> what does it mean? This text is absolutely incoherent, it has it doesn't make sense. It's incoherent. We don't. You don't have to be. We don't have to be linguists to understand that there's a problem in, the, in this in this text. Uh, the, the the pronoun the her doesn't refer to the boy and so forth. There are many uh, aspects that um, are not uh, coherent. Now, 2020, the same prompt uh, reads as follows: The meaning of life is contained in every single expression of life. It is present in the infinity of forms and phenomena that exist in all aspects of the universe. So this is much better, of course. It is abstract, so we have to think about it and the meaning. But we would not reject the task of uh, extracting meaning of this text, because this text is well constructed. Now, I prompted this. This is, by the way, this is also important to, to say. This uh, second text was generated with GPT-3. Uh, you know that GP, ChatGPT is actually based on the large language model, which is GPT 3.5 or 4. That's the latest uh, model. Um, and this text we have here on the right hand side is generated with GPT 3. Now, even between GPT 3 and GPT 3.5, which is the one that is um, freely accessible on the uh, OpenAI website, we find this result, the meaning of life, so that was my prompt, and the answer was the meaning of life is a philosophical and existential question that has been debated by scholars, theologians, and individuals throughout history. Different people and cultures have proposed various answers based on their beliefs, values, and experiences. Ah, so this is, I believe it's even more, uh, find, find stru the structure is finer. you have different perspectives, and uh, so that's what you get in uh, that you get as an, a result with GPT 3.5. This would be the full text I gave you only in the previous slide, the first part of the text. So you can see that after this block, you have a list of uh, different points. That's typical actually for a generated text. Is these things where the the, the 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 text gives more information on the. Uh, the main topic of the, the block. Okay, so what we are now, um, we can say by, um, here I quote um, a very interesting paper by Goldstein et Ali that came out this year, called Generative Language Models and Automated Inference Operations. 
uh, emerging threats uh, and potential mitigations where they show that the example that I showed you is from this paper. They, um, they claim that, as we have seen, progress in generative models over the past decade or even years, we could say, from 2022 to today, has moved shockingly quickly, quickly and produced surprising realistic outputs. I, I think we can all agree that the output is very realistic. Nobody would question that it's, uh, not, it has not been written by a human being. Okay, so that was just background information. Now what I want to do is to talk a little bit more about the opportunities and challenges related to these models, both in terms of the training data uh, and the, uh, the, the output uh, that these language models uh, generate, and then some conclusions uh, if I have time. So, um, opportunities, opportunities and challenges. And by the way, this I have uh, provided since my slides are uh, usually it's just text based because we're talking about language models and uh, textual output. I compensate this a little bit with these images that I think really interesting. So that's uh, the, the generated image for opportunities and challenges. Anyway, um, so what um, are we talking about when we talk about large language models, sophisticated AI systems designed to generate human-like text and understand natural language? So they have two abilities. Actually, it should be the other way around, because first they understand the prompt, understand in, in, in quotation marks, of course, but they're able to understand the prompt, and on the basis of the prompt, they generate a text that is human-like. By mimicking human language abilities, these models have unlocked a myriad of applications, such as chatbot and virtual assistant, or translation services. You perhaps know that you can also use these tools to translate text, so, uh, and uh, they, are, um, they are performing fairly well, um, comparable to, to DeepL on certain aspects. And they can, of course, generate content, which is what we saw earlier, based on the prompt, the meaning of life is. Uh, there are many opportunities. So in the news media, for instance, they can be used to uh, write articles, especially repetitive articles, um, but not only to get ideas about a, a topic, actually. That would be a um, better um, application. Um, they can also be used, and they are used to craft ad copies and slogans in advertisement, or they, uh, in the um, in um, e-commerce, they are used to uh, to write product descriptions and reviews. So there are many uh, positive applications also in uh, in the e educational uh, world. Of course, there are many applications for us as uh, as teachers, for instance. We can use them to create a syllabus, so to give us idea on the topic, and there are many, many uh, interesting applications. Now, uh, there are also a lot of concerns about these tools, such as, and here I have provided a list of these. For instance, the rapid propagation of false information and conspiracy narratives, the manipulation of public opinion uh, through social media in particular, um, in influence operations, meaning in elections, Plagiarism, and here we are again in uh, the uh, educational institution um, domain, where students use or have used already, we know, large language models to complete assignments. And um, what Ferrara calls the butterfly effect in AI fairness and bias, the presence, the propagation, and enhancement of biases that are present in the data and that um, you find again in the output. Um, the paper by Ferrara is very interesting because he proposes a, a typology of biases, different levels of biases that you can find, and I'm not going to go into details um, into these categories, but I'm mainly going to focus on two, the linguistic biases. What does that mean, that we have linguistic biases in the data? And the uh, uh, last one, which is the ideological and political biases. Um, when we talk about linguistic biases, um, we, according to Ferrara, we have to do with um, the, the biases towards English. And we, I will show you also in more detail what this exactly means. 
But since the majority, as Ferrara says, of the internet content is in English, um, there is a bias towards English and other dominant languages uh, at the expense of um, languages that are less represented on the internet, uh, minority languages of all important languages but are that are not as represented on the internet. Why? Because these, these, uh, these, these soft these, uh, language models are trained on data that are taken from the internet, or that are scraped from the internet. Um, okay, this is the linguistic bias and the ideal, from an ideological point of view. According to Ferrara, large language models can also learn and propagate the political and ideological biases present in their training data. Uh, and this can lead to the model generating outputs that favor certain political um, perspectives or ideologies and thereby amplifying uh, their existence. And that's why he talks about this butterfly effect. So now, uh, part two here, let's now look at the training data and look at um, especially this bias towards English. Uh, what does the, that's, um, that's, uh, what it means in more details, biases and concerns about this. Um, so there is a bias towards, in general, not only uh, English, but what we can call data-rich languages. Uh, since these language models are trained on a huge amount of data, they are data gluttons, if you want, huh? they, they, they need data huh? to uh, work the way they, they do. Actually, it's only when uh, they were trained on a sufficiently um, large size of data that they became so efficient. And this was somehow unexpected. But G GPT 3.5 is uh, trained on 300 billion tokens. GPT 4, the successor, the one that you use if you pay the, the fee, which I didn't, uh, I, I, for, for ethical reasons, I don't want to pay, so I, use, so I don't know what exactly the, the difference is, but anyway, that's the choice. But GPT 3, is, uh, 4 is a black box. We don't know, uh, even the, the, the training size of the data has not been disclosed. So we don't know exactly uh, the amount, it's probably bigger, but we don't know. Uh, so, 300 billion tokens, and you can see here uh, 60,000 million domains that have been crawled over a period of 12 years, to give you an idea of the, the size of the data. Um, and of course, what's particularly interesting are the sources. So, these texts are scraped from the internet, so we have mainly web pages, but we have social media. We have, of course, also Wikipedia, which is 5% of the total, so it's small, but it's still there. Scan books and news, uh, newspaper articles. And this goes, of course, also with uh, problems of copyright issues, because so, some of the books and newspaper articles, like the, the, the New York Times articles, they have, uh, they are, they have copyright uh, attached to it, and uh, some copyright infringements have uh, taken place here. Anyway. What is important to us, more important to us right now, is this chart here where we can see very clearly what it means when we say that uh, these language models um, are biased towards certain languages. On the right-hand side, you have a chart showing you uh, the percentage of websites using uh, the different languages. In light blue are the number of websites using English. You can see that it's more than 50% of the internet pages are in English. Uh, and then you have um, second and third position, but it's way back, uh, 6%, it's uh, German and, and Russian. Um, you have also the, the Romance languages, Spanish, French, Portuguese, and Italian, that are particularly interesting to me. That's why I, I uh, included the, 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 the abbreviations to see where they stand on this chart. But if we now compare what we have on the internet with another figure, which is the one you have on the left-hand side, where we have a listing of languages according to the number of native speakers, and this is important to underline, it's native speakers only, it's not native speakers plus uh, second language speakers. But if we look at the languages in terms of num number of native speakers, the first um, most spoken language in the world is Chinese. 
It's Chinese, which is on the internet is very small. It's two two percent of the of the the, the, the web pages. And so you can see the that is there is a, a mismatch, if you want, mismatch between the number of language speakers and uh, the uh, the number of websites using these languages. The English, the same English, is the, would be the third language, and it's um, massively represented on the internet. Italian, which is a language that I'm particularly interested in, is a, you can still see at the bottom. It's the same. <laughs> what is T? Is it is? Yeah, yeah, that would be a fair representation <laughs> on the internet. Uh, it matches very well. Okay, <laughs> Italian is not a word language, but. I guess it's even more represented on the internet than yeah. the number of speakers that might be the case. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have seen this. We have seen now that the data is mainly these models. What is also important to say is that these models have been trained uh, simultaneously with different languages. So if we prompt uh, the system in Italian, for instance, and that's what I'm mainly doing, uh, sometimes you can see that there is an English influence uh, in different ways, and this is in particularly interesting uh, from a linguistic point of view. First thing that is a macroscopic example uh, is this one. So I, I'm, I'm creating corpora of these, uh, of these generated texts so in order to then assess their, their quality, their features, etc. And I construct, I construct, I'm constructing a corpus of biographies biographies that are generated and biographies that are, we find on Wikipedia so that I can compare generated and um, human written. So I have, comp uh, I have biographies for men, for women and, and, and uh, males, males or females. And here what, what you can see is um, the, um, I, I also generate these in different languages. Here you have the output for German. So the, my prompt was Schreiber einen Text von 1000 Wörtern, um zu erklären, wer Max Schmeling ist. And you can see, I generate the several, um, several texts to see also if there is a difference between these texts. The first uh, text that was generated gives you the, the, uh, the, the, the um, output that you can read here. Max Schmeling war ein deutscher Boxer, der als einer der größten Boxer aller Zeiten gilt und so weiter und so fort. And the second generation, Max Schmeling was a German boxer who is considered one of the greatest boxers of all times. So the, it failed, the system here failed to recognize that the prompt was, is in German and generates a text in English. Hmm? So this was a particularly interesting to me because not only the, the system could not recognize a language like German, but you can see also the importance of English that uh, lays behind the, the, these models. Hmm? The same for uh, Italian, this is another example, uh, generated different texts on the, 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 the actress Anna Magnani, and uh, most of the time, I'm, I'm, I must be fair, the, uh, the output was in Italian, but here also uh, one, um, one example was in, uh, in English. Now, this is a macroscopic example to show you that, in, um, th that these models strongly rely on English. But there are also more minute and fine-grade examples where you can see that the output um, uh, contains English, what we call English calcs, structures that are not um, typical of, um, of the language that is actually prompted, but that are, uh, that are influenced by English structures. Um, an example here, that's a, a, a biography um, generated on Enrico Fermi, and um, the, the, the part that I've highlighted in red here, Fermi ha fatto importanti contributi in molti campi della fisica, fare contributi, that, that would be the structure, um, that is not idiomatic in Italian. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a construction that has been calced on English, made a contribution, that's exactly the same, make a contribution, you can find it as make a uh, factor contributi. Interestingly, so this, the second, the English text I translated with Ipel, and when I asked Ipel to translate back from English to Italian, the structure is um, the structure that should be uh, found, that's the most idiomatic in Italian, Fermi ha dato importanti contributi. Okay, uh, this perhaps I would skip to show you another example. Uh, so, to show you also that if we find 
this important influence of English on languages like Italian, which are still you know, fairly important, and we found the same for English, what about languages that are even smaller, uh, that are even less represented on the internet? And here I, um, I provide an example from a small romance variety, which is the lower Engadine, di lower Engadine dialect from the Romanche, so spoken in Switzerland with a very small community. And you can imagine that there are not many texts on the internet. So I asked uh, the here prompt, all, I always prompt, what, when I say a prompt, it's ChatGPT 3.5, to translate from English a verse from the Bible in um, the Romanche Valader uh, dialect. And uh, the result you can see on the right hand side, um, and I highlighted in, in red the aspects that are surprising and uh, that, are, that show diff difficulties in the, uh, in the translation. First of all, this first word, per, is a translation from the English for, for God. Uh, the preposition for was translated with per dieu, which is, uh, shouldn't be there in, uh, in uh, the, this uh, variety. Um, there are other two words, the begloon and comparech, here, which are non-existent even. They are non-existent in, uh, in this dialect. Um, and uh, so this is interesting because we have, you have probably heard of the hallucinations of the, of the system, that it hallucinates information, and this would be a particular case of uh, hallucination, where the, the words are invented. It's not like, it's tied to information, of course, but it's in the invention of words um, that uh, pop up in the, these texts that do not make, uh, do not make sense. So here, even in this short text, we find different aspects that are not idiomatic to the, to the variety. And you can see that the system performs much poorly on these small, uh, small languages because they are, they are not as much training data uh, as for English. So for instance, English, it works very well. It works very well for large languages, but for small languages, it's, uh, it, it, it's not as performant. Okay, so <coughs> now, uh, let's look at the third part, which is the, um, it's still looking at the textual output, but I want to show you a case study that I conducted um, to, um, the goal was to investigate a little bit more systematically uh, the, the output uh, of ChatGPT in particular related to some ideological questions and linguistic aspects that are I'm going to talk to you about. This might become a little bit more um, technical because we are talking about uh, a special structure, but I'm going to explain what it is. Uh, we're talking about, you can see a cross-linguistic study. So I, I use three languages in this study, Italian, French, and English. And um, my focus is on a structure that is called informative presupposition clefts. So I'm going to tell you what they are these clefts, cleft constructions, and what is an informative presupposition. Okay, so the goal, the general goal of this, um, this study that I've conducted in, in March was to investigate how controversial topics such as abortion, that's a topic that I, I picked, um, um, there are many more topics that I could have chosen. Interestingly, on the internet, you have lists of, um, of controversial topics um, and abortion always is always there as a particular sensitive topic, um, political topic in, in, in different countries. Think about the, the United States. So I picked this, this topic and I want to understand how this topic is conveyed in text automatically generated by large language models. What would be the output uh, asking specific questions about abortion? And my prompts are, they have more or less the, the, the uh, form of what you see here. You have the three languages, the English first, it's abortion that X, and this is what I'm interested in. What would the model say in, this, in, in, in the uh, place of the X? Hmm? And the same for Italian, l'aborto che, in French, c'est l'avortement qui. So the same structure in the three languages. And so the question is, what is this, the model going to say about the X? So um, also a bit uh, 
from the, the technical part, I used here one shot uh, prompting, meaning I don't give the, 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 a prompt where I give examples or an explanation. It's a one shot prompting and it's just about text completion. Actually, I, I made that even clearer, and you see, we will see in a moment uh, how the prompt is actually phrased. Um, let's go back to the first slide when, uh, we, where we uh, read that uh, mm, that's a, a, a declaration of OpenAI that the system uh, is able to reject inappropriate requests, and this is what we are going to see if it's uh, actually it's going to reject inappropriate request about uh, abortion. Um, and on the same page, a little bit below, um, still on the uh, OpenAI webpage, you, you can, uh, we can find that the, the, the model responds to um, harmful instructions. It will sometimes respond to harmful instructions and exhibit bias behavior. So sometimes this, uh, these safety standards are not uh, working. The specific goals of this study are the following. It's to gain knowledge on what is considered inappropriate request and how the model deals with these inappropriate, inappropriate requests, as well as the presence and the nature of biases related to abortion and related to this specific construction. So now let's look at what is an informative presupposition cleft. It's a very specific construction, I must admit, but it's a very interesting construction and we will see why. So what is a presupposition? Presupposition is a pragmatic uh, uh, concept that you find uh, in every, that we use all the time or that we, we you will see what, we, um, what it is in, by this, actually these sim very simple examples. First example, Stella stopped swimming we understand two things here. We understand that, um, I mean, there is an assertion that I make when I say stop, Stella stops swimming, that Stella no longer swims. But you understand also immediately something else is that, and this is the presupposition that is not explicit, that Stella was swimming before. And that's actually, it's uh, ingrained uh, or it's, um, it's uh, conveyed by the, the verb to stop. If someone stops something, that means that the person was doing it before. So there is an assertion and there's a, there's a presupposition in this, um, in this uh, sentence. The same with the example, Stella also swims. Uh, I assert something, I say that Stella swims, but it's, um, we also understand that uh, she does other things besides swimming. And this is related to the, this uh, also. Hmm? She swims, she reads, uh, she does uh, different kinds of things. Um, so what is a presupposition? A uh, presupposition is, at least in the prototypical realization of a presupposition, presupposition conveys a certain content, an information, that is known to the participant of the, uh, in the communicative exchange. Meaning that um, when I say Stella stopped swimming, I'm, I'm not telling you before she was swimming, because usually uh, we don't have to make that explicit, because we know already what, uh, that she, was, she stopped swimming. So that's why it's a, presuppositions are an economic way of, uh, of communicating because a lot of things that we already know, we don't have to make explicit. Otherwise we would talk at length if we they have to explicit everything. So that's um, the way presupposition work prototypically. Mm -hmm. And uh, language is full of these presuppositions and um, there are triggers that um, that activate these presuppositions. For instance, we have seen stop, a change of state verb, there are focus particles, like also, and there are what we call cleft sentences. Okay, so before we go to the cleft sentences, let's uh, look at what is an informative presupposition. An informative presupposition is an, a presupposition that conveys an information that the uh, you as a receiver uh, do not know already. So it's a new presuppose. That's why it's informative because it conveys uh, new information. Um, in general, when that happens, um, you as hearer need to, what we call, accommodate this, this uh, presupposition, meaning you have to take for granted what I'm conveying as a new piece of information. 
um, and you adjust your common ground to uh, the information that I'm telling you. Uh, so usually, if I tell you something implicitly to a presupposition and you don't know, usually you would, uh, you would act in a cooperative way, because this goes also very fast when you, you communicate. We, uh, you, um, you, you would uh, cope with and adjust your common ground, meaning you would believe that what I'm telling you is true. Okay. Um, this works usually when the, the information is uncontroversial, of course, and it's believable. So that's what the presupposition is, and it's particularly in an in informative presupposition. Now, what is a cleft sentence? This is the third um, part of the informative presupposition curve. A cleft sentence is the structure like you have here. It is Stella that ate the cookies. A cleft sentence is a, 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 it's a special construction that is composed of two parts. It is Stella. It's a, a, a copula clause, and then you have the, a second relative-like clause that uh, ate the cookies. Okay, what's it, it, it's interesting uh, here for us is that also cleft sentences convey or trigger a presupposition in the second part. Ate the cookies is something that is it's, that you have to take as a presupposition, or even if here it's explicit this time. Uh, but it's packaged in a way that um, is uh, uh, conveyed as something we know that we, we need to take for granted. Okay. And uh, an, an informative presupposition cleft, now we have it, an example that's typically found uh, at the beginning of a discourse. Uh, when we open up a book, for instance, here we have an example taken from a novel. Open up the book and the first thing I read is, ah, it was jealousy that kept David from sleeping, drove him from a tussle bed out of the dark and silent boarding house to walk the streets. So the part in, in uh, red is the part that uh, is the presupposition, uh, it's packaged as a presupposition, but that's actually not known by the reader, because you just open up the book and you have no idea who's David and what he did. Uh, so it's packaged, it's a new information, but packets as a presupposition, so uh, meaning we should know, we should take it for granted, we should accept it as true. Okay. This is a bit tricky, it's a bit, well, you have to have certain linguistic knowledge, but anyway, this, uh, what we could boil it down to is, okay, we have a construction where something is new and is presupposed, meaning we have to believe that it's true, that's the main thing. So now, uh, the, the questions that I wanted to ask with this study is, um, what, what are the new contents when we elicit, um, when we prompt the model, this is abortion that? Uh, what you have after the that is this new information, of course, because you don't know what's coming, and it's presupposed. So what are the contents that the, the, the model will generate? Hmm? What are the new contents that are conveyed? in this structure, and that we need to accommodate as readers. Are these contents neutral, or are they biased in a certain direction? Um, that's the first question. The second one is, does the presupposition change, or the content change in relation of different variables, uh, in relation to the language, or in relation to the, what I call here, the communicative aim of the Text. And I will show you how this works here now with the study design and the prompts and the collect data collection. Um, so what I prompted is practically this. I prompted 60 texts in three languages with uh, these, these um, structure, the, the cleft construction. So if we look at English, um, the, the first prompt reads as Okay, ChatGPT, write a text that starts with its abortion that. Uh, to elicit the a text that starts with its abortion that, to see what would come afterwards. Um, so that's a, you, that's a prompt that is, is in English, that's a, the, the first variable. I did the same with French and, and Italian. And um, then another variable is what I call the text aim. And this is the parts that you have in light blue. So the, the, in the first prompt, I didn't specify anything. In the second prompt, I said, write a persuasive text about what is abortion. 
And in the third one, write a manipulative text uh, about uh, that starts with, not to explain, that starts with its abortion, that. A manipulative text. So to see if the model would respond, would be cooperative, and what it would say if it would generate something. Uh. And this, in the, uh, again, the same parallel in French and in Italian. Okay, so we have here, we have, if you want, uh, actually we have two verbs, I use three, but for, for this um, presentation I only focus on two, the language, the variable of the language, Italian, French, English, and the text aim, and now you have seen, uh, it's either manipulative or persuasive, or I didn't specify. Okay, so at some, um, I generated this text in March, you can see the, that's actually the, um, the version that uh, I used back then, March 14th. And interestingly, uh, in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, the model refused to answer with the prompt that contained the word manipulative, but not with the word persuasive or neutral. Neutral is very expected, of course, but the difference between manipulative and persuasive is also fine, if you want. Huh? But manipulative, in one, uh, in the version, because you have several updates of the model, but in, in March 14, the model refused. I don't know if perhaps you have also seen this refusal. It's very apologetic. I'm sorry. <laughs> I cannot fulfill this request. And it goes against the ethical and moral standards of open and I. It's not appropriate to manipulate individuals with language or persuade, persuade, but persuasive is was fine, uh, with persuade them to adopt a particular point of view, particularly on sensitive topics such as abortion. My purpose is to provide factual and informative responses that, help, that are helpful and respectful to all users. So we can say, yes, this is okay, it's good. I mean, there is a guard wheel. It doesn't want to, um, to, manip to, to provide a text that's manipulative on March 14th, but uh, not very much later, March 29, so an, after an update of the system, then there's no guardrail anymore on that, and uh, the, the, the model generated the text that you see here. So there's absolutely no uh, rejection of, the, of this request to, as inappropriate. And there was a collaboration, and we're not going to read the text now, we don't have uh, the time. But what I'm going to look at now is exactly these results and uh, the, first, uh, the first sentence, which is the, the sentence that I'm interested in, in particular, what comes after the that. Huh? It's abortion that, and here you have, as an example, has become a hotly debated topic with opinions ranging from passionate support to vehement opposition. Hmm? And the manipulation comes, uh, and it's the whole text that is man manipulative. Hmm? Okay, so the data, my data collection is composed of 180 of these wow. texts. In this course initial position, there are more clefs in the text itself, but that's not interesting. So let, let's look at the results. And uh, the first result that's important to us is the, this X. Uh, I want to categorize a little bit this X to understand what came after the that. And um, I Notice that we can categorize it in three different, three main categories. The X is either pro-choice, and you're probably familiar with this pro-choice and pro-life distinction. Huh? So pro-choice uh, would be a view that supports the access to abortion. And an example is this. It is abortion that gives women the right to control their own bodies and make decisions about their own lives. And that's clearly pro-choice. Um, there are other responses where it was the reverse, it was pro-life. So pro-life means it, uh, it's um, a c content that opposes or restricts the access to abortion. And one example is this one, it's abortion that ends a life before it has even a chance to begin. Mm -hmm. It's completely different. Or the third category, of course, is neutral. It doesn't go in one way or the other, it's just more factual. It's neither pro-choice nor pro-life. And an example, a representative example, would be this one. It's abortion, which is often a controversial and divisive topic that sparks intense debate and strong emotions. Okay, so three different kinds of contents. Now, one interesting result is this one. So we had, I have 180 uh, structures, and what we can see is that the neutral 
content is the most frequent one. It predominates 56% of the cases. But then you have the two, the two other categories that are almost equally represented, pro-choice and pro-life. Hmm? Okay, so now uh, my uh, question was, okay, this is already interesting, but is there something, is there a correlation between these contents and the language? And the, uh, the text aim, of course, huh? and this is what we are going to see, and there, is some, there are some correlations. First, let's look at the correlation between, and this is based on a st statistical tests, uh, so that we also have sound uh, results, uh, the association between the content and the language. So what we can see here, this is a Cohen friendly association plot where we have mosaics. You can see that the, the, the chi-square value is, is, uh, is good, so the, the results are significant. And uh, we can see also that there are associations in two cases. And we can see that there is an association between two languages, Italian and French, and the pro-choice category. The other uh, categories are not uh, relevant, if you want, from a statistical point of view. But uh, for Italian and French, there is a correlation with pro-choice, and they go in two different directions. And this is really interesting, because for Italian, pro-choice uh, has a negative, uh, strong negative association with uh, the, the pro-choice content association between Italian and pro-choice, that is negative, if you want, strongly negative, and for French it's the reverse, it's strongly positive. Hmm? For English it doesn't uh, play a role. So this is a, a, a very interesting result, and then we have another very, here it's even, the, the association is even stronger with, if we look at the text aim. Hmm? We can see here that if we look at the manipulative content, which is the first row, a man is manipulative, then you have neutral uh, um, content, the pro-choice and pro-life, and here we can see that there is a very strong co uh, correlation, positive correlation between a manipulative text and pro-life, huh? and a strongly, very strong negative association between manipulative and neutral. Um, and there is also, this, this at the bottom is also um, an important result, statistically relevant, so there is a um, very strong positive association between um, not nominated, so uh, write a text uh, that, that starts with its abortion, that, um, and neutral, there's a neutral content, and there's an association with neutral content. So this is really interesting because, I mean, that means that what you prompt that has an effect on the kind of the, the content that you that you would that you, would, uh, that, you that you would get in the, as a result. In particular, puzzling is why, um, and um, it's puzzling and it's also not so easy to to explain actually why we have these correlations. Um, the, the the correlation between the languages we have seen French and Italian, uh, French correlates positively with uh, pro-life and Italian with pro-choice. So the question is, okay, does that reflect uh, biases or uh, views, opinions in the, the training data? And uh, that would be uh, the hypothesis, that would be something that uh, we, could, uh, we could think that would be a good uh, explanation, but we don't have access to the data, so we don't know. Hmm? Um, so this st this must be somehow um, ascertained in a, in a way. Yeah, perhaps a question. Yeah, um, can we have a question now? Yeah. 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 Um, for me, it's um, difficult to understand how the uh, the ChatGPT processes the, the base data. So is it just like uh, scanning through it, uh, picking like commonly. A, uh, as commonly together appearing words, mm -hmm. and this is like as, so you get the the sense of a text out of this. Mm -hmm. So like having specific um, adjectives um, with uh, specific other words together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so this is the way how it does. Yeah, it's based on the, the uh, on stat on statistical. Uh, assessment of the context. So you have a window of several words and 
the the the, the word that comes after afterwards in a sentence is based statistically on the, what is has previously been um, said so it it's statistically based yeah and i can understand the because it's not so easy to make sense of these of these results that's absolutely correct um is it really is it just uh, uh by chance because it's related to statistics or it's related to it, it reflects somehow something that is in the data itself uh, and we could say that that that's actually a question that uh, yeah. yeah because if it does just a statistic appearing on yeah. the word it doesn't understand for instance irony no it, yeah there's there's a lot of things it, that it would doesn't. take just a blank word yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, perhaps what we can say also here is that um, even if I say write a manipulative text, of course, these systems do not have any intentions. Huh? So uh, it's just statistically based. And uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't understand irony, but it doesn't understand what manipulative is either. It just generates text on the basis of, uh, of statistical um, analysis and the data that has been trained on the, 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 I, I still think that it reflects some it reflects the training data itself now uh, in order to understand exactly how it works uh, we would need to have a computational linguist or someone that knows a little bit better how this this system works but um, in order to say okay it reflects the differences in the languages that we have seen uh, it will it, it, does it reflect or not? And if yes, how uh, do we make sure that it's the case, that what, what is in the data itself? Uh, and if it's actually the case, this would be actually an in interesting way of using these tools, not uh, to uncover biases that perhaps we are not aware of uh, or, that we, uh, uh, or that we want to confirm because we know that they are there. So you, to use them, as also a mirror of uh, a biases that are ingrained in this text, are ingrained in society, and uh, that we could uh, we could highlight by this kind of reverse engineering, if you want. Yeah. Um, okay. So the question was, or is, does this depend and reflect on the underlying training data in the various languages? But we don't have access to the data, so it's also a bit tricky to answer. Um, we have also seen that there are some versions of the of ChatGPT where there is a guardrail system and the, 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 the system refuses to answer, when in particular with the manipulative text. But um, interestingly, the, the, when the system has been updated, the guardrail system was no longer there. And we would expect the reverse. We would expect that, uh, that the system would be safer by progressing over time, then uh, that to let go some of the ground system. And I'm sh actually almost done. Do I have time? <coughs> conclusion? conclusion. The conclusion would be that these are a bit more now. I, I, it's a step backwards, if you want, and it's about the goals that um, we need to set, especially as uh, the linguistic community, as linguists, what we need to do um, about these, uh, these tools and what we could do um, research-wise, what would be interesting questions uh, uh, or endeavors um, from a scientific point of view. So I would like to set here an agenda of possible questions for what would be a new research field, actually, because these language models are fairly recent. And so this is totally new also in linguistics. So the research questions could be, for instance, to what extent, to what extent are large language mo models <clears throat> really able to mimic human language and communication? And we have seen that these texts are fairly well written uh, in general, but if we look at, if we measure a large amount of these texts and, and the similar texts written by humans, there we would be able to uncover uh, uh, differences so they're not they're not striking but they they are there um, if we look more closely but we need data for that uh, the second question would be what are the difference between natural and artificial communication uh, what makes uh, text humans uh, human versus these the text generated by these tools which are we have seen again it are fairly well written but what is the difference what are the limitations of large language models 
And here, from a linguistic point of view, so tech, from a textual point of view, from a grammatical point of view, we have seen the calques from English, for instance, that so perhaps these language models would transform or would, would, uh, would diffuse some uh, innovations linguistically, huh? would be possible. What's the level of proficiency? Uh, irony we talked about, and here again we have, uh, I also mentioned irony, are these uh, models able to understand irony, implicit uh, communication, what's their competence on this? Huh? Those are all questions, big questions, for which we don't really have uh, sound answers yet. We need to, we need to, uh, to, to, to test them. Practical goals, so um, very important also, in my opinion, to inform the general public and specific groups on current opportunities and uh, limitations of these language models. We read a lot in the media about these models. Everyone, uh, I, or everyone, I mean, uh, a lot of, uh, of even journalists uh, express their own views about the quality of these models, but we, in order to really assess soundly the quality, we need to have robust uh, research on this. We cannot say on the basis of two or three texts, ah, it's great, or ah, I saw there's a mistake, they cannot, read, they cannot write. Okay, so which list would be more research in linguistics? There's very few done. There are lots, loads of research done in computational linguistics, but linguistics is an emerging field. More research on languages other than English, and this is uh, also very important because also to promote other languages than English, not only big languages like German, French, and Italian, but also smaller varieties, and develop new uh, research instruments. We need to gather data from generated text. We need to compile what we call corpora on, on these, of these uh, type of text. Also, to monitor what I just read this very interesting paper, uh, what they call behavior drift, meaning how these models change over time, and their, their, their competencies, how do they change over time. In this paper, they show that from when we, we ask them very simple mathematical questions, they can, at the beginning, they perform well, very well and seem to go backwards over time, which is puzzling. Uh, so what does it mean from a linguistic point of view? We saw the example of the manipul manipulative text where we have refusal and afterwards uh, the collaboration. So that would be an example of behavior, behavior drift. Um, and we need, of course, we need more interdisciplinary research groups. So we need to work uh, between um, or amongst linguists, computational linguists, uh, sociology and political science and so forth. So perhaps you uh, would uh, be able to do this research, especially in this great uh, a program that you are a part of, where you, you work through disciplines and the, this ring is interdisciplinary. Uh, if you are interested, um, there is a podcast that is hosted at the Center for Italian Studies. That is a, a podcast for general public about the research that um, I'm conducting with my team at the Chair of Women's Linguistics. And we have also had the pleasure of having an interview with the colleague uh, Alexander Lasch talking about uh, uh, AI and especially in education. Uh, and voila, this was, was it, a last image on the butterfly and my references. Thank you very much.